Uh, my name is Krista DeBoer. I'm the president of the Food Law Society. And on behalf of the Food Law Society, the Environmental Law Society, Environmental Law Review, and Pete and Jerry's Eggs, we want to welcome you to a really special and unique evening here at um, Harvard Law School. It's not very often that we um, get to have a couple of fine panels followed up with an awesome premiere, followed up with a wonderful dessert. So this is going to be a pretty cool night. And uh, we're glad to see all of you here tonight. Um, I won't take up too much time. I want to make sure that we have maximum time with our fine panelists. But I also want to extend a special thank you to Jesse Laflamme and to Ken Zuckerman from Pete and Jerry's for all the work that they put into this and for the support of the premiere that you'll be seeing later on tonight. So if we could give them a quick round of applause. Um, at this time, I'll introduce the moderator of our first panel. The first panel will be looking at sustainable and responsible food production. Uh, Jennifer Fahey is um, from, she's the communications director from um, Farm Aid. She's been there for nine years. And I will let her tell you a little bit more about what she does and about the other panelists that we have here. Thanks so much. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jennifer Fahey from FarmAid, and uh, just a little bit about FarmAid real briefly. Uh, we're actually headquartered here in Cambridge, um, despite the fact that for 26 years we've been serving family farmers from all over the country. Uh, we were started in 1985 by Willie Nelson, John Mellencamp, and Neil Young, and our mission is to keep family farmers on the land. Um, so to that end, uh, sustainability is a key part of our messaging and a huge opportunity for family farmers, and a lot of what we talk about is uh, sustainability. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight with our panelists. And um, let's see, I'm going to introduce our great panelists now. And um, I'm really impressed by the range of people on this panel because we start with the farmer and we go right on up the food chain. Um, so I think we have a really uh, great panel to address the issue in different facets of uh, sustainable agriculture. So on my right here, we have Emily Broadlieb. And she's a 2008 Harvard Law School graduate. And she joined the Wilmer Hale Legal Services Center here at Harvard Law School in 2010 as a senior clinical fellow in the Health Law and Policy Clinic. Her work focuses primarily on food law and policy projects aimed at increasing access to healthy foods, preventing diet-related diseases such as obesity and type 2 diabetes, and assisting small farmers and producers in participating in local food markets. To her right, we have David Waters. He has over 30 years of experience in the food industry and is the CEO of Community Servings, um, which was founded in 1990 as a home delivery um, meals program for individuals and their families um, living with HIV and AIDS. Um, very impressively, Community Servings has grown from feeding 30 individuals in Roxbury and Dorchester to over 750 in 16 communities in and around Greater Boston. And we're going to hear about the pies a bit later. <laughs> um, Next, we have Bill McGowan. He has been in the food business for 30 years as well. And um, he's been with Whole Foods Markets now for five years, um, recently in a new position after being the North Atlantic Regional Produce and Floral Coordinator, now working in prepared foods, but still working uh, very hard to develop the uh, Northeast region's uh, supply of local foods. And finally, we have Jesse Laflemme, a fourth generation farmer on the Monroe, New Hampshire farm, now known as Pete and Jerry's Organic Eggs. And Jesse runs the farm with the help of his dad, Jerry, and has, um, like many generational young farmers, really raised the bar on sustainability issues um, with a commitment, commitment to small-scale farming, organic foods, humane treatment of animals, and conservation. So um, sustainability is one of those terms that doesn't have one distinct definition. And um, so I thought tonight we'd start ask, uh, with each of the panelists telling us how sustainability um, interacts with their work in uh, the sustainable food system. Um, sustainability encompasses terms like organic, local, biodynamic, antibiotic-free, GMO-free, natural, et cetera, et cetera. You've probably all seen the labels at the grocery store. It's a little overwhelming. Um, but it's also given rise to huge opportunities as well as huge challenges, um, both for farmers and the folks trying to bring about this uh, new food system. So, um, Emily, let's start with you, and we'll just go down the row. Um, what does sustainability mean to each of you in your day-to-day -day work? Hi. 
Um, so I'd say, actually, in my work, we really um, have taken the, the word sustainable in all the contexts that Jennifer just mentioned. So really just alternatives to the industrial food system. And what we've seen, my work started really on the ground in the Mississippi Delta, where I was living for two years, doing kind of legal policy work and community development. And what we really saw was that more and more the um, legal system is framed around these big corporations, big companies producing food, and there's all these legal barriers that to them make sense with the economies of scale. They're able to kind of meet all of these regulations and barriers. But when you start getting down to the small scale level with all of these different alternative food systems, whether it's sustainable or um, local, you know, particularly a lot of our work is around local and, and finding ways to support um, the local sale of foods. We just found that there were there were these these hurdles that made it impossible for them to to survive. So we really work around um, both helping them meet those legal barriers and understand what laws they have to meet, and also on the policy side, trying to break down those barriers and um, find ways that we can have laws that that allow for. Um, the, you know these small scale farmers and alternative food to be produced, and then eventually they can jump and you know if they make it up that chain, they can get into the big um, the big food corporation category, but just to make it possible for some of those alternatives to exist. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, Community Servings is a food justice organization, and our core program is feeding sick people. Uh, started out with HIV and is now any illness. So we provide twenty five different menus every day for people with uh, cancer and heart disease and MS and AIDS and lupus, et cetera. Um, so imagine each of you in the room having to have a different menu uh, and you're all coming to my house for dinner. That's what Community Servings does every day. Uh, so for us, uh, it's a poor, sick population uh, that we're, and hungry population that we're working with. So for me, sustainable starts with beautiful food. Um, because we want to motivate you to eat when you don't feel like eating. You're going through chemo, you're depressed, you're nauseous, and if I bring you my high school cafeteria food, you're not going to eat it. So leveraging local foods and donations uh, from gleanings and local farmers is a great way to us to get free food uh, that's local and beautiful um, to bring to our clients and motivate them to eat. Um, beyond that, we're also focused on other uh, other operations in our own neighborhood, which is a poor neighborhood in, in JP. We host a farmer's market. We have a CSA. We have a CSF, if you know what that is, where we're, uh, you can come and get fresh day boat fish from Gloucester, pick it up from us once a week. Um, we have our own herb garden on site uh, because we don't use salt in our meals. We use lots of fresh herbs. Um, so we're trying to address uh, obesity issues, diabetes issues, um, but also the you know the food in inequalities built into the food system and in our uh, economy uh, that poor people can't afford healthy food. Um, farmers markets are generally not accessible. There's a whole generation that grew up not learning to cook because they were either too busy or uh, there was so much ready-made fast food which was the most affordable thing. So getting people to learn to cook again, get excited about food again is, is part of what we do. And then the third thing I would say just briefly is uh, it's about running a sustainable business. So we're a nonprofit business but we have to have the as many as much smarts and a uh, fleet of foot as any for-profit, although Pete and Jerry's gives us a pretty fast run for it on smart and fleet of foot. Um, but we've done sustainability studies of our operation in terms of what kind of chemicals we're using, how we run our trucks. Uh, we're about to partner with the city uh, and the mayor's office on how to control utilities uh, and use less natural gas. You can imagine we, we produce 2,000 meals a day. So you can imagine what a big kitchen is drawing on heat and air conditioning and natural gas on the stoves and stuff like that. So we're really looking at everything possible to um, squeeze every penny out of your donation to feed more sick people um, and make sure that it's beautiful. Hi there. Uh, for us at Whole Foods Market, I think that sustainability means um, long range planning uh, and education. And by that I mean that when we communicate with a customer from where their food comes, we find that they take greater interest in that product, they, they take greater interest in the producer of that product, uh, they feel good about those products. And that's not just, it's on two fronts. Uh, uh, the, the, everybody knows about the big local push and there's a big 
local push right now. We at Whole Foods have been working very hard on a regional sustainable food model and trying to encourage that when we're working on our planning with our farmers and our growers. But also, we, you know, we import a lot of products. Everybody eats bananas. Um, and so what is happening in those countries from a sustainability standpoint? Um, are, are we encouraging people to be good stewards of the environment, uh, of their human resource and capital in those countries as well? And by putting, in, you know, it, it's about the power of the consumer's dollar. If we can, direct, if we can educate the customer to use their dollars, uh, to make choices and decisions, we can help make long-term sustainable change, and that's the way we look at it. I guess for us, sustainability is really both a family farm and our hens, and the, the hens of uh, the hens that are on uh, uh, family farms that we work with. Uh, so, talking about the hens, uh, a lot of people don't realize in modern agriculture, how animals are treated now. Uh, and when they find out, they don't like it. Uh, it's, it's absolutely astounding. Uh, you won't believe this, but they're, they're actually building caged chicken houses now, uh, doing commercial eggs that you would buy in a regular supermarket, not Whole Foods, uh, with 650,000 chicken's in a single barn. Uh, stack systems that are, that are 12, 12 decks high. It's uh, 650,000 chicken's all one age. It's uh, it's common that an egg farm today will have at least a million hens on it. Uh, the, the largest that I, single egg farm that I know of, uh, has 15 million hens in one place. Uh, so industrial agriculture, it's, it's absolutely amazing what has happened in the last 50 or 60 years. So from our perspective, it's, uh, it's foremost about treating the hens like hens, uh, letting the hens be hens. And that, that's relatively simple. Uh, all they want to do is lay an egg in a nest. They want to be able to move around and express natural behaviors. They want to be able to scratch. Uh, they want to be able to roost. They want to be able to be able to, uh, to socialize. Um, so our barns, our farms, uh, our own farm, our family farmers, the, the barns, uh, let them do that. So incredibly important to us, uh, a big piece of sustainability. Another piece, uh, what, what they eat. Uh, our farm, our hens, and, and our family farms uh, the hens eat grain from uh, other family farms, organic family farms mostly, and, it, and it's over 10,000 acres of uh, corn and soybeans and flax seed, and, or flax, uh, flax that, that goes to feed the hens. So that's a lot of acres that are free of, of pesticides and, and all the uh, pretty nasty chemicals that are used in agriculture today. Uh, but the most important initiative for us now um, is working with family farms throughout the Northeast. And in May, we'll actually have 30 other family farms that we're partnered with. We're trying to, uh, to keep our own farm relatively small. Uh, I mean, compared to cage farms, it's very, very small. It's, it's almost insignificant. Uh, so we're doing this by partnering with, with farms that, that don't want to process eggs, which uh, there's not a whole lot to that when I say process. It's mostly washing, weighing, and putting in a carton. Uh, but they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't want to work with that uh, or, or do that extra sort of complicated step. Uh, they don't want to market their eggs necessarily. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't have the, uh, the wherewithal or the desire to um, go through all, you know, all the uh, uh, programs, uh, food safety and quality programs that we go through for customers like Whole Foods. They just want to be farmers. Uh, they just want to a little more simple life, but at the same time, uh, it's a very satisfying and very uh, demanding life uh, taking care of the hens. So what we do is, is partner um, on a contract basis where we provide uh, hens ready to lay eggs and we pay the farmer on a per dozen basis and uh, they're able to make a living and a, and a very nice living. Uh, what may sound to some people like a lot of hens, but it's, it's between 10 and usually no more than uh, 38,000 hens on a, on a single farm in a couple of barns. So that's uh, sustainability for us really is, is, is the hens and working with family farms. Great, thank you all. Um, Jesse, I'm gonna keep you in the hot seat if you don't mind. Sure. <laughs> um, you talked a little bit about some of the opportunities that hens have given the new focus on sustainability. 
wonder if you could talk about the opportunities that new young farmers have um, now that we've moved into this good food movement, as so many of us call it. It's, it's huge. I mean, it, I grew up, or my family grew up, in the commodity egg business. Uh, we've been organic and cage-free for over 15 years now. But I can remember uh, commodity agriculture, my parents just, I mean, we were on the verge of, of going out of business because we couldn't compete with, uh, was this uh, gentleman, uh, Jack Acosta, who some of you may know in, in Maine, from the egg recall that happened last summer. And he, uh, he's sort of the, the poster child for bad agriculture in this country, and he, he, his home farm is in Turner, Maine, with four million chickens. Uh, so when you're a commodity, you cannot distinguish your product, and you have to compete on scale, absolute efficiency, or uh, in some cases, cutting corners. And he was sort of a master of all of those things, especially cutting corners, uh, treating labor badly, et cetera. So this, this the new era that we're in, I like to think of as well, I is a story behind agriculture. And it's a huge opportunity for young farmers uh, in particular. And there's a, there's a new mindset, uh, creativity, uh, a willingness to, to change the way agriculture is done. Um, but again, it's so important to, t to tell that story. And I feel very fortunate that we started, uh, my father Jerry had the foresight uh, to start early with, with a branded product where we could tell that story. We could tell the story about the family farms that we work with, tell the story about the hens. Uh, but then we've partnered with, with companies like Whole Foods uh, who also tell a story and they value what we do. So I think, uh, I think the future is very bright uh, for young farmers in agriculture, particularly in, in niche markets where, where that story can be told. Um, Emily, the flip side, um, some of the barriers you mentioned that uh, communities and farmers are coming up against. I wonder if you could give us some specific examples and um, some of the policies that you're helping to put into place to help people surmount those. <coughs> Um, so just to take a step back, uh, one of the, you know, kind of the way that we're getting involved in some of this work is in addition to a new course that's being taught this, this semester that I'm teaching with my boss on food law and policy, we also have a clinical program. And throughout this year, we'll have um, about 15 law students work on different projects um, with clients in Mississippi, in Memphis, in um, Pennsylvania, and in Massachusetts that people will approach us and say, we're having this struggle, you know, we want, to, we want to have this really robust local food movement and alternative food economy, but we're having these problems. So we've done everything from, um, we really started out, as I mentioned, in Mississippi, doing kind of trainings for people that were operating new farmers markets. They just wanted to know what laws they had to, you know, abide by and what they didn't. So things like sales tax, who does that apply to? In Mississippi, there's a sales tax at grocery stores, and they were applying it at farmers markets as well. So that was sort of the, the first big policy change we did was getting rid of that sales tax because it was not bringing in enough money to really, uh, you know, warrant having the tax. And it was a huge burden for small farmers who often didn't have, you know, for them to keep track of that. If they were selling some food in some settings, it wasn't taxed, but in another setting it was. So things like that that are, you know, don't make that much sense and aren't, you know, they're just creating a barrier and not um, encouraging things like farmers markets. So that's an example. Another thing we've seen is now um, the past, I guess, five years, there's been a huge growth in farmers markets. And now a lot of states and cities are coming in and saying, you know, these farmers markets are operating. We're not sure what food safety rules they're, they're playing by. So we need to come in and we need to, you know, have them follow these rules. And I agree that, that there are rules that everyone should follow. And, you know, if we have um, some outbreak, it's going to make farmers markets look bad for everyone. But some of the rules that they're putting in place just don't make sense when you think about them. Like coming out and inspecting the farmers market isn't the same as inspecting a restaurant where you're looking for, you know, sprinklers or, you know, cleaning equipment or whatever. Farmers market, as most of us know, when, when the market's not there, there's not much there. There's nothing to inspect. So things like that that just cause a barrier, they're a cost of permitting, of getting someone out there. Um, so we're trying to kind of find rational ways to move forward with things like that. And, you know, um, again, most of our work has been at the state and local level, um, looking at state laws and, and local ordinances and finding ways that um, they're potentially applying rules that should, that should be applied to restaurants or retail stores in these other settings where they don't really make that much sense. David, um, I think probably everyone in this room has had the distinct displeasure of eating in a hospital cafeteria. And 
wondering why uh, they serve the food they do and they're trying to make sick people well. Obviously it makes sense what you've chosen to do with community serving. Um, but I wonder uh, how you took it to that next step to ensure that you're not just creating healthy people, but um, you know, a healthy local economy, healthy local farmers, um, and local communities. Uh, well, I love food, and so any topic that revolves around food I like. So uh, if I can talk about farmer's markets as well as feeding sick people uh, or an herb garden, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, but I, th I think it you... Once you delve into one piece of it, uh, you quickly see the inequities in other pieces of it. So uh, there's no, uh, in, the, in, this, in the American society, we've made a commitment to feed the elderly and a commitment to feed kids through free lunch and free breakfast programs. But to feed the sick is something that uh, the government and our society hasn't embraced. So we have to do it all through private fundraising. Um, so you start to imagine what it would be like to be that person. We've all dealt with somebody in our family who's been sick, who's struggled, who's passed away. Uh, but now imagine that you can't get out of your home. You can't feed your kids. You're worried the state's going to take your kids away. You don't have the money for resources, You're, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and how incredibly scary that would be. Um, that's where we start from. But then you start to say, well, why did they get sick? And what were they eating? And why is it that they don't know how to cook? And why is it that they need to feed their kids on a dollar a day, but the only thing they can afford is the kid's meal from McDonald's? Uh, you start to, the ripple effect as you go out to these other issues, um, I think is what draws us in, uh, and more and more all the time. Uh, but it's also what our donors are interested in, it's what our volunteers are interested in, and it's what the community's interested in. And so um, we have to embrace sort of all of it uh, to be relevant and to evolve and stay an effective nonprofit um, because we can only do what the community uh, allows us to do. Um, how are we doing on time? Oh, okay. Um, Bill, Whole Foods was founded on that triple bottom line, what they, they now call it the triple bottom line, but you um, have been people, profits, and planet. Um, Nowadays, everyone is claiming that, right? All the big box stores have their sustainability uh, initiatives. Even Monsanto is claiming they're sustainable. Um, so how does a consumer know um, whether or not the place they're buying from is sustainable or if it's just greenwashing, as some people call it? Well, again, I think that comes back to the, the communication um, and the legitimacy of that. Uh, we've worked hard in the last couple of years, Whole Foods has, to raise the bar every year on its sustainability programs, whether it be the marine stewardship and, 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 uh, and, and those issues around our waters and our fish, uh, or our Global Animal Partnership Program, uh, which we've been enacting over the last two years, addressing the issues of uh, animal welfare. And uh, I... It is a very hot topic, it, I guess, in, in terms of trying to communicate that. And I think the most important thing for the consumer is to know how larger food producers, seed companies, and the like are trying to change the rules um, and so that uh, more things can be greenwashed. And that's where the consumer needs to use their dollar and say, I'm, I'm, I'm not buying that. I'm, I'm, I get it. I understand it, I care about my food, I wanna know more about my food, and I wanna make good decisions about my food. It's kind of what David was just talking about as well. Um, uh, trying to build a culture of understanding where your food comes from, and then, especially with our younger people, and then as they learn that, they learn to make decisions with that and follow uh, um, their heart on these green mission and sustainable issues. But I think it's very important too that, um, that the industry itself uh, tries to do a, a lot of self-policing and call out those areas where, for example, I'll use organic farming. Every year, so many rules are, 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 are uh, challenged uh, related to organic farming and trying to get more and more inputs approved uh, more and more techniques have proved that were not there before. And in a lot of cases, this is so that larger farms, in particular, can uh, uh, get the yields out of what they want to do and also be, be able to call it green. 
Um, and so I think that's a very important piece of it. Okay, we are running short because these are very short panels and we all want to get to our Thanksgiving treats. Um, so we're going to do a speed lightning round. Um, I'll ask each of you the same question. Um, Willie Nelson's president, or Farm Aid's president, Willie Nelson, always says, um, he has this way of saying something so simple that communicates so much. He says, everybody eats. And what we all take that to mean is we all have a role in this good food movement. We all have something that we can do. So as inspiration for everyone here tonight, what are each of you doing to make your Thanksgiving table sustainable? Yes. <laughs> well, um, so I, I, I don't have a great response regarding Thanksgiving because I have this huge family and everyone else is planning everything and I just drive down to Philadelphia and get to enjoy a lovely feast. But I will say I integrate sustainability into my meals every night of the week. We cook almost every night. We belong to a CSA that, that um, from which we buy meat, so we get a, a box of meat every month, and that's all local pasture-raised meat. And then I shop at a lot of different farmer's markets in the city, and when I'm not at farmer's markets, I'm at Whole Foods. And so um, I try to, whenever possible, buy all the things we're cooking in our meals from local producers. And, and, and you know, again, I said earlier, I think um, – I think there's a lot of elements to sustainable. I really like the local element. I like meeting the people that we're buying food from and being able to talk to them and know how the food was created and know that, that the money is um, going to economic development, that more of the dollars are going to the farmers, et cetera. So. Hmm. Uh, in addition to using local foods in our menus, um, I, I think of it in terms of our clients' Thanksgiving um, and, uh, and thinking about the film that you're going to watch. Um, for us, it's about evoking food memories from each of our clients' uh, own culture and from their background, because if we can uh, serve them food that, that's relevant to them, it not only uh, motivates them to eat, but it also makes them feel safe. And it seems to me that Thanksgiving is all about um, home and security and, and safety and family. Uh, and so bringing a meal with all the fixings uh, that's made from scratch in our kitchen with local produce and local foods uh, is, is about the gift of love, and uh, that's what we're bringing to 750 people a day, uh, and hopefully Thanksgiving uh, will be as warm and satisfying for them as it will be for all of us. Uh, that's great. From a Whole Foods perspective, our uh, focus is on uh, bringing those local farms goods to the customer and celebrating things like heritage breeds and the like in our Thanksgiving menus uh, in our stores. For me personally, like you, I have five sisters. I go to New Jersey. I am the food police. They're terrified of me when I get there. If I see a container of Cool Whip, they know there's going to be trouble in that house. I'll tell you that. Um, so, so I always bring something unique, something different, um, something that grosses them all out just for fun. Um, and, uh, and they always seem to like it in the end. So it's, uh, it's all about education. For us, the hens are safe. They're a little, they're a little light. <laughs> they're, uh, <laughs> so we uh, typically, my family, uh, will have uh, a locally raised uh, turkey. There's actually a, a farm that does small flocks uh, just a few miles away. So we're very lucky in a rural, rural area. We're able to do that. And then, uh, of course, you know, anything and everything from our, our gardens that we can, uh, uh, potatoes or, or frozen uh, vegetables from the garden. So uh, keeping things as local as possible, and, and especially for special occasions like this, when you can take the time and, and uh, uh, source locally, it's uh, the best thing you can do. Okay, uh, we're like a pardoned turkey. We got five minutes, even <laughs> though it's uh, now six o'clock, uh, to take some questions from the audience. So uh, does anyone have any questions for our panelists? Yeah, I actually, uh, I really think it's about it's about knowledge uh, and being able to explore and, and investigate where your food comes from. I mean, it just amazes me. I, I'm sure, uh, you know, supermarket pastoral, that whole concept everyone is familiar with. But it's it's like agriculture stopped after World War II. People's idea of what agriculture stopped, 
and they stopped looking. Uh, and it's just d disgusting what's gone on since then for the most part. So now people have knowledge and they actually have the ability to uh, investigate how their food is produced. So it's, it's like knowing uh, 120 years ago where your milk came from. If it wasn't your own farm, it was the guy down the road, uh, or your meat or so forth. So you know, people are, are able to investigate, they want to investigate, they want the knowledge, uh, and they have the drive to do that. So I think that's, that's probably the biggest similarity in my mind. Coming from our side, particularly coming from the produce side where I spent the last five years, it's working with farmers to communicate to them to go back and grow things that used to be grown here years ago. Now we're grown on the West Coast. So nobody grows broccoli on the East Coast anymore in any quantities um, because, you know, the West Coast grows it. Well, give it a try. Let's, let's put some rows in. Uh, let's grow some cauliflower. Let's grow some things here on the East Coast. Um, and forego that transportation and the trucking piece and all that, which is, by the way, you know, right now we pay $7,500 per truck coming from the West Coast. So it's expensive as well. So the more of those things that we can root out of that, it becomes more of a, a sustainable model here. You know, there's a lot of, there's a story about where the iceberg capital of the East Coast was years ago, it was just south of. Portland, Maine. So we grew these things here, and of course that all moved out to California, right? So nobody grows iceberg lettuce in any quantities here on the East Coast. So bring, getting farmers to embrace those crops and bring them back here for three, six months of the year, and using the new techniques that we have now to extend the shoulders of the seasons to be able to do that. I think it's about cooking. And uh, I make the joke that my grandfather was head of research and development at General Foods in, in the 1950s. And all the foods we're trying to get away from now were, were what they were championing. And it was about getting women out of the kitchen and uh, the women who had been involved in the factories in World War II, uh, letting them go back to work. Um, and I think that was laudatory then, but um, now it's about all of us learning to take simple raw ingredients and turn them into something delicious. And uh, some of us grew up in those cultures, but a lot of people didn't. So uh, I think it's going back to the kind of cooking that you had on that farm uh, way back when um, and getting people into the kitchen again. I think you know one of the challenges that we face now is that some of these foods that 100 years ago were the cheapest foods. It was you know expensive for people to go to a restaurant or buy something that someone else spent their time preparing for them. Those are the things that are you know as we all know cheaper now. And I think we're getting better. And I think you know region by region. Again, we do a lot of work in the south. It's still a huge problem there. They have a lot of agriculture, but they're not really growing foods. So there's there's huge gaps in and you know the region I was living in there was you know, three counties together with no full service grocery store. So people either shopped at convenience stores or they had to drive up to 70 miles to get to a, a supermarket. And so I think, you know, we, we, we are on this great trend. We have a really positive panel here of people doing excellent things to reverse the trend a little bit. But I think it's getting back to making the things that are the staples of a diet um, affordable so that people can get back to, you know, a diet that they were eating 100 years ago, maybe with some benefits of knowing what they're eating, being educated, um, being able to make some of those choices, but making it possible for everyone to have the choices. I would just throw in that that's a um, slur that we get from the industrial agriculture side of things. You know that uh, sustainable agriculture, organic agriculture wants to take us back 100 years. Um, when in reality, sustainable agriculture it requires a huge knowledge base, requires huge um, perseverance and knowledge and smarts and science. It's not unscience based. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's back to the future, really. Uh, so. Any other questions? Jen. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, I can't say it was very sustainable the way we were getting our food. I mean, we would drive to actually there's a Whole Foods up in Memphis. So it was like an hour and a half and we'd bring a giant cooler and we'd go up like once a month and stock up. And they knew us as the crazy people from Mississippi. Um, but I think that's why I got really involved in farmers markets, because they're a really great way to in, in a sort of quicker way, solve this problem. I mean, it takes time to get the capital, get the money together, buy a location, build a grocery store. But a farmer's market, you can set up relatively quickly if you get the farmers. And yeah, they need to scale up and they need to know there's a market for what they're doing. But I think it's a it's a nice in-between way to address some of the food gaps. So we, we definitely, I mean, actually it was great for me because I didn't cook that much before I went there. But knowing the food options that were out there um, to buy, I had to start cooking because it wasn't really a lifestyle that was, you know, that was very healthy. So we, you know, we definitely bought a lot of stuff locally. We went to, you know, visited a lot of farmers, got to know a lot of farmers, bought stuff directly from them. But then I did have to drive all the way up there to get food. And it's, it's awful. I mean, when you actually think about food miles, we talk a lot about how far our food is coming. But we sp as much money as uh, um, uh, energy is wasted by people driving really far to go to grocery stores, et cetera. So um, not having options for people if they are driving to those places is, is adding a lot of, of fuel and, and, you know, sort of equally unsustainable. So I contributed to that, I'm sorry to say, but. One more question. <laughs> I don't think that's a popular trend, but um, <laughs> people love to save money. But you know, it's a it's a great question you ask, which is, um, why does this product cost what it does? And communicating to the customer that the farmer needs to make a living and is trying to keep their farm sustainable and put your trust in the producer of that food. Um, but uh, yeah, we're gonna actually try that this week. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna give that a shot. Great, well thank you all. And um, we have another panel coming up. Just wanted to thank everybody again for coming and joining us for what is a, a very exciting evening of, of content as well as uh, activities when you will actually be seeing the, the Boston premiere of Carol's uh, special, which will be airing on uh, WGBH this coming this coming weekend, and and on another about hundred public broadcasting stations around the around the country. Um, before I introduce Carol, and then Carol uh, has the panelists introduce themselves. I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping um, items. Uh, in the room here today, we have a lot of people and and companies that have been very very involved in in helping to get Carol's special to the point that it's at. So we have um, Anne Marie from Stone Barn, if you raise your hand for us. We have people no, no. that thank you <laughs> that are that are supporting either the special itself on PBS or the premieres of the special that we're holding in several markets or a pledge version of the special that we're also testing in in uh, in New England. So we have Lisa from uh, Cookie Head here, who you'll be enjoying her her wares out at the uh, out at the reception. Um, we have Brad Stevens in the in the house. Brad, you still here? He left. Oh, he must have known I was going to call him out by name for community <laughs> servings. Who has actually prepared the uh, the custard that we'll have during our our reception as well. And, and we have Stonyfield as well out in the reception and Jim's Organic uh, Coffee. All who are sort of part of the. Pete and Jerry's uh, family and, and team and have joined us in supporting Carol's uh, endeavor. So I met Carol about four months ago, uh, perhaps uh, miraculously, and um, saw there was a great area of commonality between our company's heirloom eggs and her heirloom meals and got to, in one short meeting, got to know her and then sort of proposed the, the wacky idea of 
I think your content is wonderful. You should make a PBS special about Thanksgiving for it. And I was thinking for a year from this <laughs> Thanksgiving. And what Carol actually managed to do was to pull together everything to make what you're about to see possible in the incredibly shortest period of time, probably in the history of, of broadcasting commercial or non-commercial, with, with a lot of help from, from people that are going to speak here, here tonight. So um, to produce for television when you've never produced for television before, and to specifically produce for public television, which has often an even higher bar for it, and then to clear almost the entire country in your, in your first effort is, is really a, a, a phenomenal and rare uh, accomplishment. And so we're, we're going to hear tonight from our panelists about a lot of the reasons of, of why the themes that are in Carol's special resonated so much with all of those public broadcasters who all schedule their own, their own programming on their own, their own stations and, and really the story that Carol is, is telling and how incredibly universal it is. So I'm going to throw things over to, uh, to Carol and thank you all for coming. Wow. Thank you, Ken. And I really, before getting into anything, really want to thank Pete and Jerry's, Ken Zuckerman in particular, for really propelling this project <laughs> because it was it was moving. I was calling it the tortoise. So <laughs> it's uh, it be rapidly became a hare. Um, and so I really want to get to the, the viewing. So we have this great panel here. And I guess maybe I'll give a little bit of an introduction of myself. And then I'm just going to let everybody speak for themselves. Um, I created Heirloom Meals because I had gotten to a point in my life where I realized that we had gotten away from the old ways of doing things. And I grew up in a three-generation household with my parents and my Italian grandparents. <laughs> And everything was made from scratch. And we ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Everything was cooked by either my mother or my grandmother or me because I stood by their side and learned how to cook since I was three years old. And as I got more and more into my adult life, I realized that this was one of the most important themes in my life, which was you know, family, cooking, and tradition. And um, so Heirloom Meals offers a multimedia journey um, it, it, to chronicle treasured family recipes, stories, and tips. And if I learned anything from my grandfather, who was a butcher, was that you know he, I, I believe it or not, I never went to McDonald's because he would not allow us. And as a little kid, I thought, Oh my goodness, we're so weird. <laughs> like, turns out like we were hardly weird. And he, he saw the change in agriculture as, as a butcher. And previously, previous to that, he was a, a farmer and lost his uh, apple farm in the Great Depression. So to grow up with uh, Depression era grandparents and parents who really saw food as currency. And, um, and I think that's where we're getting back to, where real food really is currency. So I'd like to kind of move forward and just um, a little, talk a little bit about what the themes of the, um, of the show are, because nobody's seen it yet. And we're going to be talking about them for the next uh, 15 minutes. So um, one of the main themes is uh, food is the great connector. It really is what brings people together and around the table. The next theme is the importance of tradition and heritage foods, like our connection to our heritage through our foods. And we did shoot a segment of the special at the Norman Rockwell Museum in front of the famous painting, Freedom from Want, which is the iconic Thanksgiving painting. And so when you look at that painting, it really, it's like that New England, theme, that, that idea of like really what Thanksgiving looks like. And so we're fortunate enough to be in this, in this part of the country, the Northeast. Um, and you know, it really, it's, it's somewhat of a retrospective um, and, and a documentary. 
I always said that Heirloom Meals was the, a combination of um, the History Channel meets the Food Network meets HGTV. <laughs> so so um, I would like to just hand it down and then I'll, uh, I'll ask you guys some questions. My name is Amy Traverso. I'm a senior lifestyle editor at Yankee Magazine, which means I cover mostly food uh, and some home-related topics. Um, I also have a cookbook that just came out this year called The Apple Lover's Cookbook, um, published by Norton, and it's an um, obsessive guide to <laughs> many, many varieties of apples with uh, 100 recipes. And, um, and then uh, I write about food also in my spare time for some outlets, and that's basically how I spend my time these days. <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is J.P. Lipa, and I'm the uh, director and cinematographer of uh, Heirloom Meals Thanksgiving Special. Uh, I think that's about it for me for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought you were going to prompt me. <laughs> I thought this was the introduction. I'm Sarah Bear Sinnott. I'm president of Old Ways. We're a nonprofit education organization based in Boston, guiding people to better health through heritage. We're all about traditional diets, best known probably for the Mediterranean diet pyramid, um, for popularizing olive oil, which you <laughs> wrote about, and uh, the Whole Grains Council and the Whole Grain Stamp, um, leading consumers to better health um, by consuming more whole grains. We just introduced the African Heritage Pyramid last week, which is based on the food traditions of Africa, the Caribbean, American South, and South America. My name's Louisa Kasdan, and I have to preface all this by saying that I probably come from the only Jewish household in the entire world that was not food-centric. <laughs> so, so, so I learned a lot about sharing, but not a whole lot about, about cooking. But um, the reason that I was invited is that, among other things, I'm the, I've been for a very long time the... Um, the food editor of Stuff Magazine, which is a local magazine in Boston that covers food and lifestyle and some things that make my mother blush. Um, and two years ago, I started a program called Let's Talk About Food, and it is a, um, I started it with the Museum of Science as a partner, and now we are working with science museums across the country to essentially convene the conversation about food, food and science, nutrition, all within the um, all within the confines of sort of objective um, dialogue between experts and the public. It's a lot of fun. Well, great. And we're going to stick with you, Louisa, on the first theme, which is food as the great connector. I hate this. I don't ever like going first. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you went last, and now you're um, first. <laughs> and I, but I will be fast. Um, the great con I, I truly, in the depth of my soul, believe that food is the great connector. In fact, if you looked at the website for Let's Talk About Food, the first line is that, you know, we all eat. Everybody eats. It's the great portal. And last year's interesting, um, we did a we did a big event. Uh, we had like 15,000 people on um, the Charles River from the Museum of Science down to just about MIT. And we had representatives from 30 different science museums come. And we were kind of Monday morning quarterbacking the day afterwards with everybody in the science museums. And they said, huh, would any other topic be able to touch as many points? Would any other topic be able to involve people? Because I believe that food is the is the way into thinking about health and food is the way into thinking about the environment and food is the way into thinking about family and traditions and psychology sensual pleasure you know we can go on and on but i i'm guessing that many of you in this room today have eaten something and probably in the company of another person so i truly believe that of all so there I was, excuse me, I lost my track for a second, talking to all of these program directors of um, science museums across the country, and we all concluded that no, there really isn't anything else which is as big an open umbrella for everybody who's curious and who's human to sort of take shelter under other than food. Um, so I, that is sort of in the depth of my soul why I started Let's Talk About Food, because it affects all of us every day. And unlike many more abstract things we might care about in this world, we each get to vote with our mouths and our forks several times a day, if we're lucky. And uh, that's basically 
the single big idea, and I'm trying to be mindful of time. So, okay. well, thank you. Um, and I'd like to kind of jump to the the whole idea of Thanksgiving and the notion of freedom from want and the Rockwellian iconic painting and what that conjures up in your mind, Amy. <laughs> I think um, one thing I love about writing and working for Yankee Magazine is there's a healthy respect for nostalgia <laughs> at that magazine. Um, it's something we kind of actually struggle with weekly in our meetings. Oh, is this too nostalgic, too nostalgic? But um, most magazines are so allergic to anything resembling looking backwards. And um, the nice thing about doing a magazine about New England is you're allowed to look back a little bit. Um, I think we all turn to food as one way to feel a sense of connection that we don't feel in our modern lives anymore. Um, I can't tell you in the years, I've been a food writer now for probably almost 11 years, and uh, sort of how many more people come to me now because they've just left a career in law or something else and want to be either chefs or food writers. I'm sure everybody gets those calls up here. Um, anyway, the traditional New England, I mean, I think I think as much as food in general uh, helps us to feel that sense of connection to where we come from, to our families, to history, the Thanksgiving meal is sort of the distillation of that experience. It is so ritualized, it is so traditional, it's so universal. Um, there aren't many meals that really put us back in time the way the Thanksgiving meals we eat do, whether it's, you know, making turkey the way my grandmother does, which is she, it was a great tip, she <laughs> laid, and the, you can't do this if you're kosher, but she would lay bacon uh, strips over the breast while it was roasting, and so you have this sort of self-basting turkey, um, really great flavor, and uh, the turkey, w the, the actual bacon when it's done is so good. <laughs> we used to fight over that. Um, the, I thought I would, so, so, you know, since about the mid-1800s, this traditional meal has been what we eat, and I was looking back through some old menus. Um, interestingly, the first Thanksgiving meal, 1621, uh, which was a, sort of a, a harvest festival, um, probably had its roots in Brit you know, English harvest festivals, but was, uh, was, was, I, I'm sure we all probably know our elementary school history, but 1620, very bad year. A lot of people died from uh, malnutrition and disease. 1621, the Wampanoag stepped in and helped, sh helped the pilgrims uh, learn to farm in this climate, had a great harvest, and that was the impetus for this festival. Likely foods that were eaten at that feast, probably not turkey. Turkey... There were domesticated and wild turkeys in the early American diet, but um, according to the records we have, venison and fowl were served. Um, turkey is not specified. It may well have been geese or uh, ducks. Um, seafood, uh, various what they called herbs, which may have been parsnips, carrots, collards, spinach, cabbage, sage, thyme, watercress, um, were probably on the, on the menu for that meal. Uh, lots of berries and grapes. Native American farming techniques um, did, uh, there, there was this process of sort of burning fields, um, which actually was then created ripe ground for berries to grow, so there were probably berries, wild berries or grapes, and then maize, which is the hard flint corn that w was so pivotal to the survival of these people. So a little bit different from the meals we eat now, and I'll just quickly say, um, the meal where you start to see the meals that we eat today around, let's say, here's an 1845 Thanksgiving dinner menu from a book called The New England e Economical Housekeeper and Family Receipt Book, published by Mrs. E.A. Howland of Montpelier, Vermont. Uh, menu is roast turkey stuffed, a pair of chickens stuffed and boiled with a cabbage, with cabbage and a piece of lean pork, chicken pie, now pie, hu big part of early, uh, early American uh, eating traditions and pie making was something that you did around Thanksgiving. You baked pies for three days and tried to put them away to get you through the winter. So it was 
a big baking time and not just for that specific feast. Uh, potatoes, turnip sauce, squash, onions, gravy and gravy sauce, apple and cranberry sauce, oyster sauce, brown and white bread, plum and plain pudding with sweet sauce, mince, pumpkin and apple pies, and cheese. So that, that's pretty familiar to what we eat now. Um, and here we are all these years later uh, with these traditions that kind of keep us connected to each other and to our history. Okay, and <laughs> I'm not going to you, JP, yet. <laughs> Sarah, um, you know, I figured the next stepping off point in from Amy is the importance of traditions and and those of heritage foods. And, and if you think about Thanksgiving, I mean, we talked a little bit before that, you know, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving almost conjures up like no vegetables, no heritage foods, et cetera. But in reality, I think the way people kept their heritage is alive during Thanksgiving was bringing in those types of dishes. Yes, and, and also, you know, I think that we don't think about Thanksgiving and health in the same breath. We, we think of it as, you know, a big <laughs> meal and we're just all going to eat a lot. But really, um, when you think about it, Thanksgiving it, it is really healthy. It's about um, sharing, as we've all talked. Um, it's really a, a, a place uh, where you bring your heart to the table. And then when you think of traditional diets, heritage diets, the, the foundation of uh, traditional diets are greens and beans and nuts, um, vegetables, fruits, tubers, a lot of what you just um, finished describing. It sounds like a lot of plants which are really um, what science tells us are a really healthy way to eat um, traditional heritage meals. Um, I've, been, I, I've been hearing a lot lately um, about people really focusing more on the sides of Thanksgiving dinner um, rather than um, what we all think of as a, you know, the big turkey, but to, um, to think of the sides. So I've started asking people who I've talked to on the phone and I asked the Old Way staff for uh, what they were cooking for sides and what I heard were some corn pudding, roasted Brussels sprouts, sauces, um, other than just cranberry, pesto, tapenade, baba ganoush, spicy tomato. These are all traditional um, foods from around the world. Quinoa with nuts and currants, ginger curried garbanzos, black barley, um, must have squash or the world would come tumbling down. My mom's green rice casserole, roasted asparagus. These are all great plant foods and um, very, very healthy and uh, bringing many traditions together. And then also uh, Thanksgiving's healthy. It's, it's a celebration, um, bringing families together. Um, maybe you eat a little bit more, but it's really um, about great food and family together. And JP, I would love to know what was it about working on heirloom meals that resonated with you the most? Uh, I guess it's difficult to maybe pinpoint one reason. Certainly the plethora of reasons that you've talked about uh, I think resonated with me from the beginning. Um, but I think also I had a slight ulterior motive as well. Um, I, I've been a filmmaker for several years now, uh, mostly as a cinematographer. And in fact, this project sort of started, uh, the first meeting we had uh, was in a bar, just sort of discussing the initial idea. And um, again, my background is photography. And I think by default, I just became the director because we, we both sort of looked at each other and was like, we're gonna need a director. <laughs> and I was like, that's, that's not me. <laughs> and um, I think just due to costs and trying to do this extremely quickly, which we've talked about, um, it was shot in about six days uh, with a seventh as a pickup day. And one of the, the reasons, we'll get back to the question, I think is uh, I've been looking for sort of the sustainable version of filmmaking to some degree. Uh, I've been in Los Angeles for about 10 years working on uh, everything and nothing out there. And uh, I've been wanting to sort of take my, uh, my vision and talent back to the East Coast, where I'm from, Berkshire County, and try the best that I could to, to make a living um, back in Berkshire County, which is difficult given um, certain skills that require one to travel 
um, and and be a part of productions which for the most part are, are fairly egregious in terms of energy consumption and um, use of resources. So I think that was always a, on my mind. How can I produce something that is of Hollywood quality um, that people will take seriously but still has a, a message? And um, that was always my goal. I, I basically, uh, a couple years ago, packed up my camera gear and decided to come back here with my brother and to do what we could. And then Carol, I, um, presented this to me. I, I don't think either of us thought that we'd be speaking about it in any capacity, um, certainly not here, um, or even be picked up by PBS. This was sort of almost an experiment for us. And uh, the biggest concern right from the start was how do we, or at least something on my mind was I did not want to make this a cooking show. And I don't think Carol did either. Um, not that I don't like cooking shows. I hope that wasn't offensive to anyone. <laughs> Uh, I do, but it's not necessarily my cup of tea, and I wanted to try to at least impart the knowledge and the skill set from a cooking show, but at the same time maybe add a cinematic flair to it, um, which I don't know, I guess it's been done before, but maybe not um, in a way that gets out to people, um, is maybe flying under the radar more. So that was sort of my initial idea, well, Carol has a, sh a real shell of an idea here, and um, it's very possible that we could take this idea and um, with what I know filmmaking-wise, apply a certain amount of techniques that basically were done by my brother and I. There's very, very little crew on this, on this um, shoot, and in fact, all the lights used were all um, fluorescent lights for the most part. Um, I should say 80%, we did have one energy consuming light. Um, but for the most part, we've tried to really um, do our best to keep um, a light footprint. And that is something that filmmaking in general, it's just difficult to do. Um, again, giving massive amounts of energy and just labor. There was very little labor overall in the shoot and the labor that was there was confined to a tight group um, that had a basic overall idea of of what we wanted to achieve and with certain skills to be able to achieve it. Uh, so I th it's hard to say any, any one thing. All of these are great ideas and all of these uh, ideas that, have, um, that we've been talking about for the last hour are things that have always, um, something I've wanted to incorporate in my own life and also into work. And uh, I hope it's something that everyone enjoys watching. And um, just on a technical note, um, <laughs> this one, <laughs> Are we wrapping up here? You could go ahead. All right. <laughs> uh, this isn't exactly the ideal screening situation. Just in, again, he's a perfectionist. Uh, <laughs> the uh, this has been fine-tuned and optimized for what hopefully many of you will catch um, during Thanksgiving week and on on Thanksgiving Day uh, for the small screen. In terms of projecting at large. Um, we didn't exactly shoot it this way, and so you'll probably see some discrepancies visually, and also the audio uh, sort of needs a fine-tuned mixing for this kind of display. But for the most part, I, we're, we're pretty proud of what we were able to achieve so quickly, and uh, I just hope everyone enjoys it. Okay, and then do we have a couple more seconds? Okay. How much? Okay, I want to do another lightning round. Okay, quickly, I'm going to start. On the end again, what's your best food memory? <laughs> <laughs> That's not an answerable question for me. I mean, I'm someone who owned three restaurants at one point. I have just too many. It's kind of like a crowd. My best food memory, though, I can tell you, um, came surging at me in a wave of Yankee Magazine-inspired nostalgia this week um, because it is Thanksgiving. And I have two wonderful daughters, and one of them is going to have a baby in Paris soon, and the other one is a filmmaker in L.A., so I feel your pain. Um, and it's Thanksgiving, and neither of them are coming home. I have a huge family. We're all getting together, but not my children. So I wrote them a letter this week about all the things they needed to do. They needed to know about how to make Thanksgiving without mom. <laughs> And, you know, I was a little weepy on my keyboard, but, um, you know, to me, as I'm sitting here listening to everyone talk about tradition and holiday and food, the, 
the saddest picture is the absolute um, sort of obverse of the Norman Rockwell painting that you cite, which is the idea, and I've seen it in a photograph, of somebody sitting at a cafeteria table eating Thanksgiving dinner by themselves. And because that's such a pang, that's a powerful food memory, not, not a best one, but here I'm worried about my daughters each eating their little Thanksgiving dinners by themselves and feeling kind of bereft. Sarah? <laughs> um, because uh, I've done a lot of work with the Mediterranean diet and um, in the Mediterranean, I'd say my uh, favorite food memory was that we had a, Old Ways had a symposium in uh, Crete and uh, uh, we had a dinner at a schoolhouse, a restored schoolhouse, and all the women in the town brought uh, um, what they call horta, you know, green pies and, and uh, lots of beans. And it was like a, a main baked bean supper, but uh, in Crete. And uh, then the men danced after dinner, and the women threw plates, and children sang. And it was, a, it was really one of those great pinch me moments with amazing food. JP? Um, I'm going to kind of go the opposite approach and talk about maybe my least favorite food memory, because there are so many great ones. Um, but I tried to do the master cleanse diet several years ago. <laughs> I just don't recommend that. <laughs> I tried that too. <laughs> I feel so energetic. It's just maple syrup. And then day two, you're psychotic. Um, so I, I feel like this is so cliche, but truly, like my whole affinity for food, it all comes from my Italian grandparents and their... They're the sausage hanging in the basement and the wine that my grandfather made and picking peas, sweet peas, off the vines in his garden. And um, he, he, he lived in this neighborhood with all these Italian guys, all their neighbors, their yards all met in the back. It, they all lived around the block. And it was a competition every year to see whose tomatoes ripened earliest. <laughs> And I wasn't actually alive for this, but I'm told that one year my grandfather went to the supermarket and bought some <laughs> tomatoes <laughs> and at night went out and tied them all on his plants. <laughs> I, just, I just love what that says about the importance of food in my family. So it's, it's all those memories together. Well, that, that, and that yours? Me. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to see. <laughs> you put me on the hot seat. Well, it's probably sitting at the the family dinner table with my grandfather imploring me to eat and um, I mean I, I could just I'm there and it was really a happy time and at that time you know I was just so much a part of the family I didn't realize that I was actually chubby because I actually ate everything that they asked <laughs> me to eat <laughs> and you know what that was actually a great thing <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it's like kind of a fusion of my my whole family experience is my memory. So, and we're now gonna walk down that uh, food memory lane, and and hopefully everybody will stay and and watch the special. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.